Well, if you would, take uh, your Bibles and let's turn to Luke 1. We'll start there. Some might imagine that sort of looking at some of the same passages year after year would grow old, and not to me. I love, love these passages. I love these songs, these hymns of Christmas time. I enjoy so much about the season, though I find as I've gotten older, I uh, uh, find it more challenging sometimes to appreciate the beauty and the joy all around me with so many different things occupying time and attention. But uh, just a wonderful, wonderful time. I love uh, getting our tree every year. That's a fun family time. I love Lori putting the lights on the tree every year. <laughs> That preserves my sanctification for after putting the tree in the stand, which uh, causes me to have to repent most years. <laughs> it's good to see her put the, the lights and decorate the, the tree. So many wonderful things about this season. I enjoyed our, our open house, uh, the rinks open house last night. That was a lot of fun. And and uh, then going to the Bethel Baptist Church in Dawsonville, live nativity each year. We uh, often go to that, and that's a wonderful time. If you've never been, they do it on the second weekend, Friday and Saturday night of December. And uh, it's a, a tractor and a trailer pulling you through the woods, and they have the life of Christ uh, acted out along the way. And that was a wonderful time. I also love the music of Christmas. That, uh, it's sort of a, a mystery about the way many musical arrangements are put together. There's, there's a depth, there's a, uh, a pondering that, uh, that comes forth from me as I hear you know, th that rendition, uh, let every, uh, the, the one the prior to that. There's a, there's a somberness, a seriousness, and a joy about good music. Well, we... We just heard the music to Mary, Did You Know? Let me raise your hand if you have heard that song less than 500 times <laughs> since 1990. <laughs> that is a very popular Christmas song. Uh, if you turn on the radio, any of the Christmas radio stations, you'll hear it pretty quickly after turning it on. Well, raise your hand if you have a strong opinion about that song. Anybody here that's just on edge because maybe we just played that. Why would you play that song? Or others, well, that's the best thing we could have ever done. Let's play Mary, Did You Know. Did you know it was even a controversial song? It's controversial among uh, Catholics. It's a controversial song among Protestants and evangelicals. For various reasons. But let's, let's think about that. Now, the song's not the point of the sermon, but we're going to look at what Mary knew and when, did she, when she knew it. So what did Mary know and when did she know it? So Mark Lowry wrote that song, I believe, for his church Christmas presentation, maybe in the late 80s. And then I think it was like 89 or 90 that he and another person put it together to music. And little do they know how it would would take off. But to ask some questions of Mary. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Did Mary know that? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you've delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man? Did you know your baby boy would calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again. The lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know? that your baby boy is the Lord of all creation? Did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? That sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. Did you know? Let me read from Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. 
And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And then she went to see Elizabeth and said in verse 46, said or saying, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones, exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Our Father, thank you for your word. <clears throat> the word of God is living and powerful, able to pierce through to our hearts, exposing our sin, opening them to truth, convincing us of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, calling us to repent and believe, and then washing us in the water of the word. Lord, please teach us your word, I pray today, and grow your people. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, as I said, both Catholics and Protestants, some Catholics and some Protestants, have a problem with Mary, did you know? One Catholic writer, uh, Father Robert McTeague, uh, echoes the concerns of many Catholic believers he says that this song, in essence, can undo Christmas if taken literally. And here's what he says. While the song has the merits of prompting its hearers to reflect on Mary beholding her divine son, lines from the very first stanza actually bring Christmas to a screeching halt. Here are the problematic lyrics. Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you deliver will soon deliver you. He says, now those lines make sense if Mary is another sinner like us who needs to be delivered from her sin. You see, if Mary is a sinner who, like us, needs a Savior, then the lyricists play on the word deliver, since one deliver equals give birth, since two deliver equals liberate from sin, is both clever and theologically sound. But if Mary is a sinner in need of a Savior, then she cannot be the worthy vessel in whom the all-holy God takes on human nature as the Word made flesh. In other words, the lyrics depend upon the dogma of the immaculate conception being false. If Mary needs a Savior, then she cannot be the vessel of the Incarnation. And no incarnation equals no Christmas. How ironic that a song sung with so much gusto as a Christmas hymn logically precludes what it claims to celebrate. So, uh, and he's right. If, uh, if the immaculate conception is true, then the song must be 
false. And the song is an attack on the immaculate conception. And that's the problem that the father has with the song. By the way, let me ask you, do you believe in the immaculate conception? Don't nod your head or anything. I'll have to, you know, embarrass you or something. <laughs> do you believe in the immaculate conception? What is the immaculate conception? I think many Christians just automatically say yes because they're thinking of, the, uh, of Jesus and his righteousness. But the immaculate conception concerns not Jesus but Mary. And let me just read the words from Pope Pius as he sums up the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. We declare, pronounce, and define that the doctrine which holds that the most blessed Virgin Mary, in the first instance of her conception by singular grace and privilege granted by Almighty God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, was preserved free from all stain of original sin, is a doctrine revealed by God, and therefore to be believed firmly and constantly by all the faithful. So that's the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. The Immaculate Conception has to do with Mary, that Mary was conceived without original sin. And so therein is the problem that a Roman Catholic has with both the song and the scripture, though they, re, they, mis, they misinterpret the scripture, is that Mary says that he's my deliverer. He's God, my Savior. And they don't believe that Mary needs such a Savior from her sin because she is sinless. And so we, de we deny the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, again referring to Mary. So we can understand why Catholics have a problem with the song, and they believe it undoes Christmas. But many Protestants and evangelicals have a problem with the song as well. And sometimes a little in, a, in such a snarky way, they say, well, you know, Mary, did you know? And the answer is yes, of course she knew, because that's what the Bible tells us, that Mary knew. Mary knew because Gabriel told her. She knew from her Old Testament training. She knew what Gabriel told her. She knew based on the song that she sung herself. She knew. Therefore, some would say it's heretical to sing such a song and ask such questions as, Mary, did you no. Now contrast that with Dr. Brandon Meeks, and I read his article to you last time, so I'm going to just give you some summary uh, last uh, year, so I'm just going to give you a couple of summary points from it this time, and I'll give you the entirety of it. He says, Mary, did you know, is one of the best Christmas songs of the last 30 years. So we've got uh, some Catholics who use it in mass, Many Catholics deny it, reject it, oppose it as heresy based on the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. We've got some Protestants who reject it as heresy because, of course, Mary knew, and we're wrong to ask the question. And we've got other Protestants like Dr. Meeks who says it's the best Christmas song in the last 30 years. And here's his argument. He says, the only people confused by the song are those who know absolutely nothing of how poetry or the rest of language works. Those who complain are more solution than problem. They don't understand the poetry of rhetorical devices, and so their own attempts at art die cruel deaths by their own hands, suicide by dull instrument. When Moses composed his famous song, he asked, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Only a fool would think he was asking for a list by which he could weigh his options. When Deborah the judge wrote her historical tune, she too asked a rhetorical question in the eighth verse of the fifth chapter. When you gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. Was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel? No one can reasonably assume she was asking, she was telling. David, that sweet singer of Israel, may have been the worst. Over and over again, he asked questions to which he and everyone else already knew the answer. Who is this king of glory? Who is a God like our God? 
Will God cast off his people forever? The aim of the question was meant to stir zeal and enthusiasm. Many of the psalms were appropriately fight songs. The questions were rallying cries, not queries for new information. The questions were the answers. And he said, I'll stop for here, but uh, suffice it to say that virtually every songster in the entire Bible asked rhetorical questions for edification and emphasis. The same can be said for the great hymn writers through the history of the church. And can it be? What wondrous love is this? What child is this? Is it any wonder that modern writers can hardly produce usable, sustainable art? Don't bother answering. It's rhetorical. <laughs> we all know the answer. Well, I think Dr. Meeks is right. <laughs> he helped me through some of my ponderings. Poetry indeed is a lost art in modern times. So bottom line, we don't need to put too much uh, guilt and condemnation and give poor old Mark Lowry too many problems. <laughs> He'll just turn those on us in a comedy routine, if you know who Mark Lowry is. He was, after all, writing a Christmas song for his church's Christmas program that turned into a very popular Christmas hymn, a Christmas song, and he was trying to communicate truths about the Christmas story using this rhetorical device. Well, what did Mary know, and when did she know it? It's a good question. And I'm going to give you three things, three points, uh, trying to answer the question, what did Mary know? First of all, Mary knew the importance of an angelic visitation. Secondly, Mary knew the promises of a coming Messiah from David, and she knew that she was in David's line, and therefore she knew the word of God, and she knew what the angel, she would come to conclude what the angel told her was true. Thirdly, Mary knew the distinction between God and man and everything else. So first of all, Mary knew the importance of an angelic visitation. So old Elizabeth, if you can imagine, elderly Elizabeth is pregnant. Same sort of Abraham and Sarah kind of story because nothing is impossible with God. Old women getting pregnant, no issue for God. <laughs> Nothing is impossible with him. And so there before Mary was this living testimony of the miraculous work of God. Elizabeth, whom we'll look at a little more next week, was pregnant. Mary was close to Elizabeth. She was six months pregnant. It was a supernatural pregnancy, different from Mary's pregnancy, but supernatural nonetheless. So it's the sixth month of her pregnancy, and Gabriel is sent. There are only two angels named in Scripture, Gabriel, and who's the other one? Michael. Michael. So these are, these are big-time angels. These are angels of the presence of the Lord. And when an angel showed up, as we saw last Lord's Day, it was a big deal. It was a big deal in the Old Testament. It's a big deal in the New Testament. Angels showed up in the Old Testament. What did people start doing? They start, you know, bowing down and cooking things. <laughs> Stay with us, please. They loved the angels. They saw the angels as, as for what they were, messengers from the presence of the Lord. So this is a big deal. Gabriel shows up, and he comes to this rural area to this small, insignificant town of Nazareth, a town derided by some. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> Just a, a, nothing in the world standards, sort of like the towns maybe you grew up in. Small little county. I grew up in the smallest population county in the state in a, in a town that uh, one of the latest census had about 500 people in the city limits. So... Not, not a big player on the world stage. <laughs> you know, no one's really calling down to Crawfordville, Georgia, to see kind of what are you guys, you know, let me get my finger on the pulse of Crawfordville. Well, it's Nazareth, small rural area, small insignificant town to a young insignificant girl, insignificant by world standards. She had no pull, no influence, no, no one have, would have said, well, when we call down to Nazareth, let's get Mary on the phone. 
She's the one we want to talk to. Nothing like that. Mary's a young girl. She was of marriageable age, which then would have been, you know, 12, 13 years old. Uh, she could have been as young as 12 or 13. Almost certainly she was a teenager. So she is very young. She's a girl in that culture and insignificant in the insignificant town of Nazareth. Young Mary, in no money, no resources, you know, of any significance. She was just a, an average, poor, small town, insignificant girl. But based on what we read about her, she was a sharp thinker. She was a solid theologian. In fact, if you had been a wise person and you wanted sound theology, Mary would have been a good person to visit with. Mary talked to me about the Old Testament. This young teenager knew her Bible. She knew the Old Testament. Her name Mary is from Miriam, the sister of Moses. And so that tells you a little bit about her family. They were devout Jews. She grew up hearing the, the stories of Moses. She, she, under, she, she had heard the, the, the first five books of the Bible. She knew the promises of the Old Testament. She was deeply rooted, and her song later on, beginning in verse 47, she's essentially piecing together pieces from the Old Testament and turning them into lyric. Digging within her heart, she pulls up Scripture. This young lady who had a great command of the promises of the word of the Lord. So here she is. This young lady. And so she knew from her understanding of the Old Testament that when angels showed up, that was significant. This was important. Perhaps they were showing up to bring judgment or perhaps they're showing up to bring a message. And what kind of message would the angels be bringing to me, a young teenage girl in Nazareth? So she was astonished by what was happening. She was troubled by the event. In fact, she was scared to death. An angel showed up to talk to her. And so she knew that was a big deal. Now, when we read this account of, of Mary here, it says she was, the angel says to her, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she's greatly troubled at the saying. She's trying to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel says, do not be afraid. So she's troubled. She's discerning. She is afraid. This, again, is a big deal. She's a discerning. She, she's weighing what the angel says. We know that about Mary. Luke chapter 2, after Jesus is born, all this activity surrounding his birth, and Mary is pondering these things in her heart. She's a thinker. She's a ponderer. She's a considerer. She's a discerner of things. And so Mary is discerning these things. You know, Paul said, even if an angel from heaven, in Galatians 1.8, if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. So just because a person has what they think might be an angelic visitation or some spine-tingling experience imagining that it's revelation, listen, if anyone or any being teaches a gospel contrary to the gospel contained in Scripture, you're not to listen to them. In fact, let them be damned. And so Mary is discerning. We could learn a bit from her discernment, couldn't we? And so Mary is fearful, she's comforted by the angel, she's discerning, she is inquisitive. And the angel calms her down. One of the ministries of angels is comforting the people of God, reminding her she's found favor with God, and she's going to conceive and bear a son, it's going to be called great. And then Mary says in her inquisitiveness in verse 34, how will this be since I am a virgin? So Mary's asking questions. Um, how could it be, Gabriel, that this is going to happen? So this is an important event. Gabriel shows up. Promises from antiquity are about to be fulfilled. A virgin, according to Isaiah 9, is going to be with child, going to give birth to this child, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. 
because nothing is impossible with God. Not only is it not impossible for an elderly woman to get pregnant by normal means, it's also not impossible for a woman who's never been with a man to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Nothing is impossible with God, and that's what she is going to be reminded of here in verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God. And he couples his statements to Mary, to that of Elizabeth. Behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son. This is the sixth month with her is called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. So this young teenager knew this was an important message. This was a message from God. She knew as, as, the, as the angels talking to her here about the Holy Spirit, he says in verse 31, you're going to conceive in your womb and bear a son. He's going to be called Jesus. And she says, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And the angel says in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the most high will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born will be called holy, the Son of God. Now, how does she learn about the Holy Spirit? Well, she learned about the Holy Spirit. Again, remember Miriam, Moses' sister, Moses, highly regarded, revered by the Israelites, gave us the first five books of the Bible. In the very early verses of Genesis, we have the, the Spirit of God in verse 2 hovering over the face of the waters. So God created the heavens and the earth, but it was without form. It was void. It was empty. It was dark, but the Holy Spirit is there hovering, the Bible says, over the face of the waters. And then God begins forming this mass of material that he's created. And we have the account of creation, but the Holy Spirit is hovering. The Holy Spirit is, is God's agent. The Father is, is working. The Spirit who is God is working. And we learn as well that the Son is working, the agent of creation. So Mary knew about the Holy Spirit. But now the Holy Spirit is going to come upon her. And he is going, God is going to produce in her this baby who is going to be Son of Man and Son of God. She knew. She knew this was an important angelic visitation, and she knew that nothing was impossible with God. She knew that Moses had led the Israelites across the Red Sea, that Joshua had read them, led them across the Jordan River, that Abraham and Sarah had given birth to Isaac, that Elizabeth, an elderly lady, was right then pregnant, that nothing was too hard for God. She knew what the Bible had promised. She knew about the sovereignty of God in all things. And so she got this was a big event. Something big was about to transpire, was actually transpiring. Secondly, Mary knew the Old Testament promises of a coming Messiah from David, and she knew that she was in David's line, and she knew everything that the angel told her. Simply, she knew the Word of God in the Old Testament. She accepted it from the angel as the word of God, she knew the scriptures. She knew the scriptures. Now, what does Genesis 3 tell us? We go back to Genesis verse chapter 3 and verse 15. He's, uh, the Lord is pronouncing his curse here upon the serpent and says in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So here we have in Genesis 3.15, the early gospel. Shadowed to some extent, but the gospel nevertheless, that Eve, who had been tempted by the serpent, who had yielded to temptation and then given the fruit to her husband, and he had, in a more high-handed, rebellious way, sinned against God in taking the fruit. She's also, the daughter of Eve, is also going to be the means of the salvation of a vast multitude and the destruction of the serpent. 
So what a mercy, what a grace, what a providence of God. And she knew this promise. And she knew the messianic promises of the Old Testament, and she knew that the Messiah was going to come through David's line, and she knew that she was in David's line. So was Joseph. She, of course, never imagined that she herself was going to be the, going to be the one who gave birth to the Messiah, but she knew these prophecies. She had been trained in the Old Testament. She was expectant. She was anticipating the Messiah. She knew the Messiah was going to come to her family, either then or generations to come. But it was going to be, the Messiah was going to come in her family. She knew that a second Joshua, that's the, what Jesus is. Jesus is Joshua, the deliverer. God is going to deliver his people, that he was coming, that he would occupy an eternal throne because nothing was impossible with God. She knew. And so we see in verse 47, she says, My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He's looked on the humble estate of his servant. All generations are going to call me blessed. He's done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him, generation to generation. He's shown strength with his arm. He's scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. All of these, are, he's, she's piecing together the Old Testament. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones, exalted those of humble estate, filled the hungry with uh, good things, the rich he sent away empty. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. She connected what the angel told her, the fact that she was the vehicle that would deliver the Messiah, she connected that to God's covenantal promises in the Old Testament, his promises to Abraham and his offspring forever. Mary knew the Old Testament promises. Mary knew that from those promises came David, and from David would come the Messiah, and she accepted them as the word of God, and she accepted the angel's message as the word of the Lord. So she did, in fact, know everything the angel told her. She knew the Old Testament prior to that, and she, all of it was clarified, and she knew more specifics when the angel showed up and said, you're the one. <laughs> you're the one that's highly favored. You're the one that's going to bear the Savior. Thirdly, Mary knew the distinction between God and man and everything else. Mary knew what Catholics do not know. that she, Mary knew that she was not immaculately conceived. It is obvious. Any sort of fair treatment of the language here, any, any uh, good exegesis will reveal that Mary knew that she was an unworthy sinner, that she needed a savior. In verse 38, she says, I'm a servant of the Lord. And verse 47, my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. Mary knew that she was not some sort of co-redeemer with Christ, but she herself was in need of redemption. She was a sinner in need of a savior. She knew the distinction between God and man and everything else. A chosen, graced vehicle to give birth to Christ. Verse 30, don't be afraid. You found favor with God. You're going to conceive in your womb, bear a son, call his name Jesus. He's going to be great. He's going to be great, the son of the Most High. She knew what that meant. She knew that she was not God. She was not the fourth member of the Trinity, which wouldn't make it a Trinity anymore, right? <laughs> she was not a Redeemer, that there is a Redeemer, Christ the Lord. But she was a blessed one. It's amazing how many times Mary's called blessed in this text. If you, if you go back to verse, um, let's see, you go back to verse... Uh, Look at verse 30, for example. Mary is called blessed, or she's found favor with God. He says that in verse 28 as well. You found favor. The Lord's favor is on you. 
You go down to verse 42, and she exclaimed with a loud cry. This is Elizabeth talking about Mary. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And then verse 45, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And then you look at verse 48, and Mary says it of herself, for he has looked upon the humble estate of his servant, for behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. Mary is the blessed mother of our Lord. You can say that without joining the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> Because that's what the scripture says. She is the blessed mother of our Lord. From her comes the humanity of our Savior. And the Lord provided his deity. And he came from heaven. He is very God a very God. She knew the distinctions. She knew she was a sinner in need of a Savior. Verse 46, she knew that she was a worshiper, not the one to be worshipped. And so she magnifies the Lord. So we look at Mary, and what we should see when we look at Mary through Scripture is a magnifying glass. Mary magnifies who? The Lord. Mary doesn't say, look, put me under the magnifying glass. You look at the magnifying glass and look at me and examine my virtue and my righteousness and my holiness. But Mary says, let me be a magnifying glass. Look through me and see how great God is. That's the right way to consider Mary, right? That's what your life ought to be. Is that folks look at you and you don't make God bigger than he is. You can't add anything to God. But folks look through you and they see through your testimony, through your life, how great God is. Because you worship God. You are humble before God. You are a servant of the Lord. That's the way to look at Mary. Not as one to be worshipped. Not as a mediator between God and man. Not as one who can appease the righteous anger of God. But Mary is one who looked to Christ as her mediator. Who indeed trusted in her son, the son of God. There are things that were beyond Mary's ability to comprehend, but she knew this distinction. Most of my uh, early morning time of late uh, has been in Genesis, and one of the things that is just so striking in the book of Genesis is the distinctions that are made in the early chapters and throughout. But early on in the Bible, it's pretty clear who God is and who man is, right? The distinction between God and man. We get into trouble in our culture because we can't see the distinctions about anything. Man is God and God is man. Or, you know, it's not hard when you go to the book of Genesis to figure it out that there's man and there's woman and there's distinction and there's difference. It's our culture that can't figure it out. And we're running out of letters in the alphabet, trying to describe what people are identifying to be in our world. Well, Genesis tells us there is distinction between man and woman. There's a distinction between humans and animals. And if we get that mixed up, we begin worshiping our pets rather than worshiping God. Animals are not people. They're creatures to be dominated by people, loved and treasured and cared for, but not Worship. Romans 1 talks of people who begin worshiping creatures. I'm not God. I'm not a woman. <laughs> Hope you can figure that, look at me and tell. I'm not a plant. I'm not an animal. Uh, one of uh, my low points, perhaps, in childhood education is when we were getting a lesson on evolution, and, and I guess I was a little too bold for my third grade pants, and uh, I said to the teacher out loud in front of the whole class, you may have come from a monkey, but I didn't. <laughs> and uh, well, my mother and dad heard a lot of things from my teachers growing up. So I'm, I'm an example of what not to be as a student. All the way from grade 1 to grade 12, don't follow my example in many ways. <laughs> But I know, I mean, it's obvious, right? I mean, we act animalistic in our culture. We act like we're just beasts, 
moving all the time on our most craven desires and instincts, but there's distinction. And we blur the distinction to our own peril, to the peril of the church. And then when that happens, we lose our ability to worship God. Mary knew her place, her role. She was a servant of God in need of a Savior. Let me give you kind of a lengthy uh, piece from John Piper about Mary. I think this will be helpful to us. He says, The veneration given to Mary in the Roman Catholic Church is beyond what is warranted by the New Testament. In fact, it is astonishing how little we see of Mary in the New Testament. Let us honor her unique motherhood. Let us count her blessed as the mother of our incarnate Lord. But let us not put her on a pedestal that neither she nor Jesus would have approved of. After she turns up with the disciples praying in the upper room in Acts 1.14, she's never mentioned again in the New Testament. That is astonishing to anyone who thinks that the veneration of Mary was an essential part of the early, of early church life. It was not important enough to be mentioned in any of the New Testament books after Acts. Now, if the veneration of Mary was so important, it probably would have shown up in the, the epistles, right? That's what, he's, that's what he's saying. In fact, the, only, the, the one place where Paul comes close to mentioning Mary, he chooses not to and simply speaks of generic woman. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of woman. Now, he could have easily said Mary, if that was his objective, to venerate Mary. And then when he, she's mentioned in Acts 1.14, she's Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. This inclusion of the brothers has the effect of minimizing any emerging elevation of Mary as having significance only in being the mother of Jesus rather than the mother of his brothers as well. Mary is unique above all women in being a virgin when she gave birth to her firstborn son, and of course that son being the Messiah. And when she asked the angel how that can be, he answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Yet amazingly, this fact, the virgin birth of Jesus by Mary is never mentioned again in the New Testament. Though it's essential to our faith, he's not, the Scripture's not trying to venerate Mary ever. She's blessed She's holy, she should be loved, but she certainly should not be worshipped. When Mary is referred to during the adult life of Jesus in the gospel, she's not treated in a way that sets her apart in any unusual way. At the cross, for example, Matthew refers to her without ever mentioning that she's Jesus' mother. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Calling Jesus' mother the mother of James and Joseph is striking. We know that this is Jesus' mother because of Matthew 13, 55. Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? James and Joseph are the sons in both Matthew 27 and 13. So Matthew refers to Mary without calling her Mary the mother of Jesus. And a few verses later, he simply refers to her as the other Mary, Matthew 27, 16. And then he says, most striking of all is the way Jesus intentionally deflects a certain kind of honor from his mother. Once a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. But Jesus replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Jesus ranks obedience to the word of God above the special veneration of his mother. Similarly, Jesus was once told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But Jesus answered, Luke 8, 20 and 21, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Again, Jesus ranks obedience above the standing of his mother. Mary was a magnificent woman, wasn't she? Her humility shines. He looked upon the humility of his servant, Luke 148. Her faith was profound. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord, Luke 145. Her suffering was deep. A sword will pierce through your soul. Her God was sovereign. He shone strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of her, their hearts. Luke 1, 51 and 52. Her meditations were full of truth. Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. Therefore, Piper says, remember her, admire her, bless her, be inspired by her, but don't go beyond what the New Testament portrays. Did Jesus love his mother? Yes, he did. 
She was there at the end. As What an example of what motherhood is. When forsaken by all, rejected by the world, hated and despised, there she was at the cross of Christ. And what was Jesus doing? What did Jesus do before he died? He made sure that she would be cared for. Behold your son. Behold your mother. He loved her. He saw that she would be cared for. But he didn't worship her. And neither did he call on anyone else to worship her. So what did Mary know? Mary knew, didn't she, the Old Testament prophecy. She knew about the Messiah. She knew he would come from David. She knew she was in David's line. She knew what the angel told her, that she was favored and blessed by God. She knew that after the angel explained it to her, she was going to conceive and bear a son, that he was going to be great, the son of the Most High God, and that being one son meant you bore the very nature of. And so the son that she would give birth to bore the very nature of God. She got that. Did she fully get all the implications of that? I don't think so. But she got that. He was God. He could do what God could do. He had the nature of God. And yet, he was her son. And he wasn't like the, it wasn't like they were sort of mixed together, like 50-50. Sort of that, you know, humanity is deified or deity is humanized, but fully God and fully man in one person, this divine union without any mixture without any confusion, but, but fully God and fully man. Did Mary fully understand that? Do you? With a full canon of Scripture, do you fully get that? Mary got I mean, Mary got it. She understood it. Caused her to worship God. She knew that, he would, that her son was the son of the Most High. She knew that he was going to rule on the throne of his father, David, because the angel told her. She knew that this was going to require divine, a divine miracle. And so the angel explained it to her again. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. Nothing's impossible. She knew. She knew what she describes in verse 47 through 55. Those are, again, Old Testament truths who are rooted deep in her heart. She knew these things. So, Mary, did you know? Yes, I knew. I, yes, I knew. If it was d- designed to be that sort of question, if the song was designed to be that sort of question, well, yes, yes, I knew. Well, just briefly, when did she know that? When did she know that? When did she know the Scriptures? Now, again, remember, Mary is just a young girl when the angel shows up here. So that argues if Mary at a at say let's say she's 14 so arbitrarily pull it out of the air she's 14 so if Mary at 14 has this this well-rounded understanding of the Old Testament that she can without a scroll in front of her dig down into her heart and sing a song rich in the theology what does that tell you about Mary that tells you 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, as Paul said of Timothy, from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise in a salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So when did Mary know what she knew? She knew much of what she, she learned much of what she knew from childhood. From childhood she knew the holy scriptures. I mean, our educators, many educators in this day of time, sell children short. You know, we've got, a, we've got a pamper and baby and withhold and weight. And I promise you, your children can learn from the time they're very young. And they can learn big truths. And they can begin putting pieces together at a very young age. They can learn that God is great and God is good. They can learn the, that God is big and righteous and that we are sinners. They can pray and learn to ask God, help me not to sin. They can learn things about the Trinity. They can learn things about the nature of the, the two natures of Christ. 
they can learn about promises to in the Old Testament. And boy, we should be really rooting them in the Old Testament stories, the way Mary was. Mary knew. And then she learned more from the angel. And then she kept on learning and kept on growing. So I would just encourage you as parents and any of you who work with children and train children, train them up so that when they're at a, at a very young, they can dig down into their hearts and they can recall the word of God. Because listen, this is what we live by. We live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But not only teach them the word of God, just sort of memorizing it, that's good, meditating on it, that's good. Teach them how to apply the scriptures. Teach them how to act on the scriptures. Train up your children. That means more than simply they, they become sort of Bible memorization robots, but they know how to apply scripture. They learn how to think through the lens of scripture. They learn to see their need of a savior. So some of you maybe got some very young children and you give, tell one of your young children to go to the kitchen and bake a cake. Okay, I'll see you in, I'll see you in a couple of hours. Bring that cake to me and serve it up hot. They're not going to be able to do that. Why? They might could repeat the command, Mommy says bake a cake. <laughs> but can they bake a cake? No, they need to be trained. And so what does a, what does a thoughtful and visionary mother do? If she wants her daughter to be able to bake a cake and cook a meal, and guys need to learn that too. But uh, what if she wants her daughter to do it, what is she going to do? When the time she's very young, she's going to have her on the counter. She's going to be less concerned about flour all over the kitchen than she is about training up that child to be able to live in this world and honor Christ. She's going to get those little hands in flour and dough, mixing things, cutting things, fixing things. It's going to take ten times longer sometimes to cook, bake, whatever you're doing. But you're training up the next generation, aren't you, mothers? It's a, it's a valuable thing. They don't get it by simply commanding things. It's, you know, it's like that in Scripture, too. I mean, yes, it's true. The Bible says don't do this and do the other. And we need to hear those commands. But those commands are designed to stir up, well, help me to understand what that looks like. How do I apply that? How do I live that out in my life? What, is, what, is, what, what does that look like in my family? So I can know the Bible says husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, but what does that look like practically? And I get the big picture of, you know, the, the Bible does, you know, that uh, sacrifice and in a sanctifying way and very specifically and all of the other. But how do I flesh that out? And so I look to the scripture and I find examples there. I find examples in Christian history and biography. I learn the theology behind that. So train your children up. Teach them the word of God. Exemplify the faith before them. I encourage parents to read the scriptures to their children. And the best time is when they're very young because the older they get, the more difficult it is to pull your family together because of competing demands and challenges and life changes that happen as children grow up and disperse in various places. So you've got really just a few years to do, the mo to do most of this training in your home, training them up with Scripture, history, church history, biography, systematic theology. I mean, those are really the th three primary food groups, of course, Scripture being the primary food group. <laughs> but train them in the Word of God. Teach them Christian history and biography. Teach them systematic theology. Give them solid hymnody. Teach them good hymns, hymns of the faith. Teach them about distinctions because they're living in a world without distinctions where we don't know who a boy is and who a girl is, and who God is and who man is, and who man is and who animal, what animals are. We, we don't know anything anymore. And we're, we're weak people. We're emotionally weak. And those, so folks are bringing chickens on airplanes because it's their emotional support. And they're bringing pigs on airplanes <laughs> to sit beside them. Because they need the emotional support because they're too weak to, to go without their chicken or their airplane. We're training up weak people who don't know anything about anything. We need to teach them the word of God. Teach them to submit to 
the Scripture? What did Mary, Mary teach us about that? Behold, the servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. We, and Mary teaches us about worship. My soul magnifies the Lord. What kind of worship honors God? That which is rooted in truth and spirit. My spirit rejoices in what? God, my Savior. Heart, truth. Heart, truth. Spirit, truth, worship. All exemplified for us in Mary's song. Did Mary know that her baby boy would one day walk on water? I doubt it. I doubt it she knew that. <laughs> but she knew that he could, I think. I mean, I think she knew if he has the very nature of God, there's nothing that's impossible for him. But I don't think she knew specifically he was going to walk on water. I don't think that uh, she knew specifically that he was going to give sight to a blind man, that he was going to calm the storm with his hand. But I do think that she knew that he was going to make her new, that he was going to deliver her. Did she know the blind was going to see, the deaf was going to hear? She might have because she had the messianic promises that when the Messiah came, those sorts of things were going to come with him. Did you know? Well, Mary knew, but Mary was learning. And then we, in, in Luke 2, we see Mary's pondering these things in her heart. But in Luke 1, when, um, when, I'm sorry, Luke 2, when Mary and Joseph go to the temple and they hear the uh, Simeon's story and testimony and see Simeon's joy in, the, in that, what, what does it say of Scripture? What does it say of, of Mary there? And Joseph, verse 33. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. So what was said about him? The time of purification, according to the law of Moses. In verse 22, they brought him to Jerusalem to present to the Lord to offer the sacrifice. So they're, they're, they know the law. They're obedient to the law. There's this man in Jerusalem, Simeon, verse 25. And he was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him and had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he saw the Lord's Christ. He came to the Spirit, came in the Spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. He took him in his arms, blessed God, and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles. And for glory to your people, Israel. Mary knew, and yet Mary marveled and pondered and wondered at what all this could mean. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. So the thoughts from many hearts will be revealed. So can you imagine, parents, you can't. I, I know you. And I know me. Can you imagine giving birth to a perfect child that never does anything wrong? <laughs> can you imagine that? Now, some of you think that your children are really close, right? Right? <laughs> They're really close. They could never do anything wrong. So that, that uh, you say, well, that's wonderful. I mean, that's just the bliss of parenthood. Never does anything wrong. But think of what's going on here. Mary is pregnant. She is a virgin, but no one else but Joseph is going to get that. And so for all of those years, this Simple woman is going to be explaining and answering questions and receiving criticisms and challenges about her baby. Most people aren't, no one's going to get, believe that at that time. And Jesus, as uh, I heard John MacArthur say recently, he didn't really do anything uh, for 30 years. I mean, spectacular. He worked in the carpenter shop. He lived with Mary and Joseph. He was obedient and subject to his parents. But he's not out performing miracles. I know you can buy books that say that he was doing magic tricks and turning his, you know, his friends into 
pets and stuff and you know he turned a, he turned one of his buddies into a dog and turned you know he's doing all these little tricks you can buy books that say that but he, there's no record of anything jesus did for 30 years so mary and joseph raising a child and many people are imagining that he was born in sin and then when he begins his public ministry and he's performing miracles and great works most people don't believe him and they ultimately cry out for his crucifixion and so this is painful isn't it and even Jesus' own family doesn't get it at first they don't get it I mean, they think he's out of his mind so even his, his siblings think he's crazy painful and then Mary there, knowing the prophecy, knowing what the angel said, living with a perfect child, seeing the works of Christ, hearing the preaching of Jesus. There she is at the cross. How would you feel as a mother if your son is hanging on a cross, beaten beyond recognition, nails pierced through his hands, feet, mocked, hated? How would you feel? if you saw such a thing. And then knowing that he was perfect, he was holy, that every, every curse against him was an unjust one because he was the just Messiah. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also. And so, why did the sword pierce the Savior? He was bruised and beaten and died for Mary and for you. That's what it was all about. Mary knew that unto us is born a Savior, Christ the Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to ask humble questions of the scripture with a desire to be taught and to learn, to, to have things clarified, have our understanding deepened. Thank you for this blessed girl rooted in truth who feared God, who submitted to the Savior and worshipped the Savior and looked to the Savior for her salvation. Help us, O oh Lord, to do the same, to fear God, to submit to the Savior. And to worship the King of all kings. Lord, there's so many things uh, this time of year that are just causing us or tempting us to turn our heads away from this glorious, majestic, mysterious truth. A truth that should cause us to ponder and marvel and worship. Thank you for sending your son, the son that you love, your only son, to die for sinners like us. In Jesus' name we pray.